My name is Mitch Altman, and I'm uh, most well known probably for inventing a keychain with one button. It turns off TVs in public places. It's called TV Be Gone. And um, I've been making a living on that for the last 13 years, which is pretty awesome. I also uh, started one of the early US hacker spaces called NoiseBridge. And um, I travel around the world since then, helping other hacker spaces get going and keep going. And we share notes. Hacker spaces around the world all help each other, and I love helping. Uh, and I give talks and workshops on all sorts of things, uh, workshops on uh, for people of all ages to learn to solder and to make cool things with electronics. So um, yeah, and now that I'm home uh, more this year than in um, more recent years, I'm working on a bunch of collaborative projects uh, at NoiseBridge and with other people here. Yeah, so NoiseBridge is uh, a really cool hackerspace. Um, I'm kind of biased since I'm one of the two co-founders back in 2007, but uh, I really love it there. It's a great supportive community. There's hundreds of people who go through there a week, and it's, um, it's a hackerspace. It's a physical place where we have uh, a supportive community uh, where people come to share and learn and teach, and we've got lots and lots of tools in electronics and art and craft and science whatever people there want to um, want to play with, want to learn with. And people are constantly exploring, creating a uh, creative environment for people to explore what, what it is that they find meaning in doing, what they really like doing. Uh, many people end up finding projects that other people like. They find opportunities there and make a living from it. But the main thing is people are doing it simply because they enjoy it. And it's, it's an amazing place to go. And NoiseBridge, I mean, all hackerspaces are unique. Uh, NoiseBridge is unique. Uh, but um, um, like all hackerspaces, people can come of any skill level and come and learn and, and try things. It's a very safe environment for trying and failing. And you learn a lot from failing. And, uh, and it's fun to fail in this kind of environment. Uh, NoiseBridge is unique um, in that uh, most hackerspaces are nonprofit. NoiseBridge is also a nonprofit but they're more traditional with a board of directors that makes final decisions, probably with members who make lots of recommendations and vote on things. With NoiseBridge, we explicitly made an anarchist space because um, if we didn't do that, I would be a leader and that takes too much work. So uh, at NoiseBridge, there's no leaders and uh, we self-organized to make everything happen and it's been working great for us for uh, 10 years now with only one rule, and our one rule is be excellent to each other. And uh, it's kind of corny, but it really works for us. And we've got an um, uh, annual budget, which is somewhat low for what we do. We've got about 500 square meters full of pretty amazing tools. Um, the annual budget is 70,000 US dollars a year, and we get all of that plus extra just from individual small donations from lots of people. So it really works, and everyone's always welcome as long as they follow our one rule. Well, um, so NoiseBridge is open to anyone. Like I said, as long as they follow our one rule, everyone's welcome at NoiseBridge. Uh, it doesn't matter how much or how little money you have. There are homeless people who come to NoiseBridge. There are people who work at Google. There are people with trust accounts, whatever. Anyone's welcome as long as they follow our one rule. And, and it works really well. If people violate that one rule, then they hear about it, and they're given a chance. They're given chances to change their behavior. And and people, you know, if they like NoiseBridge, they they want to get along with with other people, and, and it works well. So we have all these different tools uh, for all sorts of different people who want to learn and do and try and and play with different things um, and work on different things. So whether it's sewing machines or soldering irons. Um, or 3D printers, uh, laser cutter, machine shop, metal forge, uh, people who have, I mean, we've got lots of computers for people who do number crunching for doing scientific research, uh, uh, physiology, like neuroscience. Um, it attracts all these different kinds of people. And uh, our one rule is subjective. And that's one of the ways our culture stays alive and uh, keeps from coming dogmatic. and keeps attracting new people as well. So it's a constant discussion of what is and isn't excellent. So um, 
uh, we don't even write down examples of what is and isn't excellent because that can just start becoming more like rules. The one exception we made for that is our code of conduct, which um, we made an exception for because it does make more people feel welcome to come to Noisebridge, and that's been helpful. Um, that's also um, a conversation that's ongoing so that people are always involved with that. We want Noisebridge to be a place where people feel as safe as possible, uh, hopefully much more safe than society at large. And that's been working for us. And we, we always strive to get better because no matter where we're at, we can always improve. And there's always room for improvement, especially in a world as we live in, which is far from ideal, no matter what your perspective is. Yeah, everyone's welcome. We have no age restrictions. So there's lots of people who bring their little kids. And, um, you know, to be excellent, you want to make sure uh, little kids are going to be safe there and not going to start playing with tools that might hurt them uh, or the tools. Um, so, but that's worked great. Everyone's looking out for one another there. Um, and there are people of any age. I'd say most people, um, given the demographics of San Francisco, are in their 20s and 30s with some of their 40s and, you know, old people like me and older. Um, but uh, lots of little kids. Some people come during lunch break from middle school or high school. Um, and I'd love to see more of that. Sometimes people come in, uh, a teacher brings their school class in uh, from public schools or private schools um, and have a field trip, sometimes something very structured, sometimes they just come and play. Uh, it's, it's always really interesting that way. We even get groups of school people from colleges, universities, and even high schools from around the world when they come to San Francisco because it's a a tech mecca, you know, so, and one of the places people quite often want to see is Noisebridge because it's another aspect of what makes San Francisco so cool and why all of this tech grew out of San Francisco rather than, you know, Omaha, Nebraska or Paris, France. Why did it happen in San Francisco? Well, it's because of people who are totally weird, like the people who started Noisebridge and, uh, and support each other in community for people to do all sorts of interesting things, not just what you're supposed to do. And uh, Noisebridge is a great example of what's still happening in San Francisco that keeps San Francisco a very creative and lively place. Yeah, well, we, we decided to have a legal structure. At the, uh, we had about a year of discussions, because in 2007, when we started Noisebridge, there weren't many examples to draw from, especially in the United States. Most were in, in Germany. And um, so we talked for about a year on how to organize ourselves. We decided we would have a legal corporation, nonprofit corporation in the state of California, um, which gives uh, federal uh, tax exemption from the Internal Revenue Service for people who donate to us. And because uh, that more closely aligned with what, how we would actually run ourselves day to day as a nonprofit where lots of individuals would donate to keep us going and keep our uh, rent paid and internet paid, et cetera. So we also wanted to have a legal structure that reflected how we run day to day in as much as um, we want to be an anarchist organization without formal leadership. So anarchy is as we see it, and that works well for us, is not there's no organization, that, that can't work ever. But uh, people self-organize temporarily to make projects happen, to make cool things happen that we want to make happen. If people can self-organize to make it happen, it does. Uh, and then if people can't, there's not enough people to help, if help's needed, well, then they have time and energy to try and do other cool things. And that's the way it works for us. But uh, as a legal nonprofit corporation, uh, we decided to be a membership organization where members uh, vote on what to do uh, for the organization itself. But the organization is, um, is, is as thin as possible with as little overhead as possible. We have no staff. It's all people who uh, volunteer to do what needs to be done. And there are a lot of people doing that, and it works great for us. Um, so um, we have um, people. Well, in order for anything to get, to get done at Noisebridge, people have to do it. It's the only way anything gets done there. 
And in fact, it's the only way anything gets done anywhere. But for us, that's very explicit. Uh, we call that duocracy. So there doesn't have to be a formal decision for much to happen. Um, and there's rarely a formal decision. Noisebridge only exists as an infrastructure for all the cool things in Noisebridge that happens to happen. Um, so, but occasionally we do need to have a formal decision and we do that by consensus. So 100% of all the members have to be happy enough for a proposal to move forward for it to move forward. And that takes a while, but it works well for us when we need to do that because everyone's happy enough to proceed and uh, so there's not, uh, as we've seen recently in uh, elections around the world, uh, a lot of people are unhappy with the results. Um, some people are happy, a lot of people are unhappy, whatever. At Noisebridge, we want to make sure everyone's happy enough for things to proceed. But since it's, it's kind of an ordeal to do those kind of decisions, we only do it when really necessary, when it affects the entire community or when it takes a lot of money. Like if we ever need to move again, we'll need a consensus on where to move. If we um, want to restructure some of the physical aspects of the space, like build a new room, as we did uh, last year to make a metal uh, working area, uh, we needed a, consens a consensus for the budget, which was substantial. Um, so we consensed upon that, and people made a master plan that there was a consensus to approve as well. And our board of directors, which is required, to have a nonprofit the way we have it. Uh, in our bylaws, the only thing that nonprofit can do is to approve the consensus of the members. So that's the way things work at Noisebridge. Most things on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, people just do it. And if it requires some money, uh, we've, we've just loosely decided if it's less than 500, just go ahead and do it if you feel that there's no objection and then uh, you can get paid back, like for buying toilet paper, things like that. Or if there's materials, uh, we have set aside a project uh, equipment fund. So if you want something cool for Noisebridge, uh, you can raise half the funds, however we, way you want it, and then Noisebridge will pay the other half. Um, so it's all fairly informal, except when we need formality, and when is formal and when is the need for informal and formal uh, is just decided by people using their best judgment and following our one rule. It works well. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so let me, let me answer the, the thing about members first. So there are members at Noisebridge, but one of the things with Noisebridge, unlike most uh, hackerspaces around the world, you don't need to be a member at Noisebridge. And I'll also say that most hackerspaces aren't uh, organized as anarchist spaces. They're more f just traditional kind of um, nonprofits with a board of directors that makes decisions and members that have votes and make recommendations. Um, and the, it, whatever way works for each space is the way each space organizes itself. and. Um, and we all help each other, each other regardless of how our spaces are organized and the focuses we have. Um, that's part of why, the big reason why hackerspaces have grown from the handful in 2007 to thousands around the world now. Um, but Noisebridge, we have members. Uh, membership involves uh, a consensus of members in good standing to accept a new member. So if there's no objections uh, to someone who wants to be a member, they become a member. And to be a member, you pay a certain amount a month. And for us, it's $80 a month standard, or we have a starving hacker rate of $40 a month. Uh, but since that's a lot of money, even $40 a month is a lot of money for some people, you don't need to be a member to do really anything at Noisebridge. The only thing that membership gives uh, that other people don't get is automatic 24-hour access to the physical space. Um, and our transit card can be uh, programmed uh, to be both your transit card and your key access 24 hours into Noisebridge. If you're not a member, your transit card or any RFID uh, token can also be used as an uh, entrance to Noisebridge, but it's not automatically 24 hours. Um, we have this other way to have 24-hour access, and we call that... Uh, I don't know why we call it this, but we call it philanthropist, but it's not the regular philanthropist in English usually means someone who's got a lot of money and they give it to charities. 
Uh, a noise bridge, a philanthropist, just means you give some amount of money that you agree with with our treasurer every month, and then you get 24-hour access, and you have responsibility for closing the space if you're the last one there after our regular open hours, which are 11 in the morning till 10 at night. And, um, uh, and, and people in general who are philanthropists or members take on more responsibility. Again, no rules about that. It's just, it's just the way it, it's been working. Uh, the one other thing that um, members get that everyone else doesn't get is full participation in our consensus process. So consensus, uh, the way we do it, um, someone has a proposal, we talk about it, the proposal changes as people bring up objections, and everyone changes the proposal in order to have it be as best as possible. Um, hopefully that everyone will agree on the proposal as it morphs into a form that everyone's happy enough so it can proceed. If uh, that can happen, the proposal moves forward. If it can't, we just agree, well, let's talk about it more, or we can put it aside, or we can just agree this isn't going to happen. If things get really out of control, I mean, we're dealing with humans, right? Humans, there's misunderstandings. Sometimes there's conflict. In Noise Bridge, we always have worked out our conflicts, even some pretty major ones. Um, but in discussions, things can get out of hand. In a healthy consensus process, we keep bringing up objections, asking people if there are objections, changing the proposal, having it be um, uh, hopefully one that everyone's happy enough eventually that we can have it go forward. But if things do get emotional and out of hand, um, the a member in good standing has the ability to block. And a block really should never happen in a healthy consensus process or discussion. Um, but if things really are out of hand, someone can say, this isn't working for me. If this proposal continues to move forward in this manner, I can't in good conscience continue to be a member of NoiseBridge. And so I've got to block this now. And um, that doesn't happen at NoiseBridge. Um, our consensus decisions really are very healthy. We had a, a period about four years ago, which I can talk about if you like, where things were pretty bad. There were some serious conflicts going on that we were trying various ways to resolve the problem. Um, and the consensus meetings were not fun to be at. Um, we fixed the problem by closing the space, and the only people allowed in were people uh, who were cleaning, fixing, reorganizing. Um, and we were closed for a month. We reopened, and it's been getting, uh, it has been fantastic since and continues to get better. Um, so, uh, but since, and we call that the reboot. When a computer isn't working well, you can turn the uh, computer off and on again, and if the operating system is good enough still, uh, it can fix some problems. And our operating system at NoiseBridge was actually quite strong and quite healthy, even amongst uh, amidst the, um, the, the conflicts. And so we recovered quite well, and the reboot was great. And since the reboot, our consensus process and our meetings have been really enjoyable processes. So we have had no need for anyone to block. Um, so, um, yeah, so everyone at NoiseBridge, uh, members, philanthropists, and everyone, uh, are welcome at NoiseBridge as, as long as they follow our one rule, and everyone's welcome at all of our meetings. Everything about, uh, NoiseBridge is transparent, and everyone's welcome to be part of the discussion, um, to use our tools. Everything at NoiseBridge is free. People can donate, and all those individual small donations add up to more than our annual budget. Of seventy thousand a year, we cur currently have um, uh, ten months of operating expenses in the bank, and we are raising more money so that we can uh, hopefully buy either our building that we're in or buy a building in our neighborhood, so we don't have to worry about uh, the ups and downs of the economy and the uh, rent uh, going up too high, which happens uh, unfortunately and has happened to a lot of nonprofits in San Francisco. Um, so. Um, in the past, about once a year, we've dipped below three months of operating expenses. And I was the first treasurer of NoiseBridge. And as the first treasurer of NoiseBridge for the first two years, I made sure that we always have three months of operating expenses in the bank. And if it dips below, that everyone freaks out. 
and we want to freak out then and not when we have zero months of operating expenses. And it's worked well. And when we have dipped below, which happened about once a year uh, before the reboot, um, we would have a, um, a fundraising party. And those parties have raised uh, about $5,000, and that would give us enough money that we'd been, be fine for the rest of the year. And we'd have local bands, bands who are people of part of the Noisebridge community. Uh, we'd have artists come in and people demo things, and we'd have food and drink for donations and donations at the door, but not required. And it's just a really fun way to make money. The reboot, um, we um, needed a bunch of money for infrastructure to rebuild things and paint and resand the floors and a bunch of material. So for that, we decided to have an Indiegogo crowdsource funding campaign, which was way successful. We get, got more money than we asked for, and um, it, it re-energized people uh, in our community locally and as well as the international community around the world of people who wanted to support Noise Bridge. So it, was, it felt uh, warm and fuzzy all the way around. It was a lot of work uh, to do all that stuff for the reboot, but it, that work made everyone involved, um, whether through donations, through the crowdsource campaign, wherever in the world, or people locally here being in the space, working together and playfully working together. It was a lot of fun even though it was a lot of work to do this. And what we saw is that when everyone's doing this kind of work, just like at the beginning of our uh, space back in 2008, when we got our first physical space, people feel involved that they're creating the space they're uh, a part of. And uh, we found that was really uh, important and really fantastic way for the community to uh, feel good about itself. Each person feel good being part of it and um, uh, making our community uh, healthier and stronger. So every year since then, we have what we call a mini reboot. And uh, that's a weekend closing the place where only people, uh, uh, um, only people fixing and um, uh, reorganizing and whatever are in the space. And we just did that uh, two weeks ago. And again, it was re-energizing. It felt really good. And all these new people come and all these old people who had maybe drifted away a little come back. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool. So finances have never been a, a problem at Noisebridge. We've been pretty lucky that way. Hackerspaces around the world uh, quite often struggle with finances, but very rarely do communities fold because of financial problems. Uh, somehow, it always works out that they get enough each year to pay for the expenses of the year. Um, there are other um, aspects uh, of the handful of hackerspaces that have closed, more dealing with um, problems with community. And community is hard work, but it's well worth it if it works enough for everyone involved. Right, uh, mostly uh, at Noisebridge, new people come in and they learn by doing and asking and playing and trying and failing and trying again and succeeding and learning and learning from all of this. And, uh, and then they can, they're part of the whole process for other new people who come. Um, since the reboot, we've um, made it much more explicit on how people come into the building and become part of the community. It's still really easy, but now if a new person comes to Noisebridge, like when you came the first time, you probably rang the doorbell and someone let you in and gave you a tour of Noisebridge and uh, hopefully made you feel very welcome. And that's, that's what we want. For everyone who comes, who rings our doorbell for the first time, they're, they're let in, made to feel very welcome. They're given a tour and shown what Noisebridge is all about. Not only the areas of the space and the tools and all the cool things there that anyone can use for free, but also about our philosophy, you know, that we have one rule, that there's no leaders, that everything's done there by everyone doing it. You don't have to ask permission. Uh, just talk to people, get a sense if there's objections. If there isn't, just do it. That's how, that's how all these cool things happen. That's how everything at Noisebridge has happened. And then, um, and then you know, people are also uh, told that we're a nonprofit and that if they can and want to, they can donate at any time, any amount, small or big. And that's how we get all of our money and stay, uh, keep the doors open. And then they are now 
part of NoiseBridge as long as they follow our one rule, which is be excellent to each other. And uh, then if the doorbell rings again, even that day or the few minutes later, they can give a tour to the next person. And this is how our culture is known to everyone who's in the space and is passed along to new people who come in the space. So, and if anyone, um, you know, as part of the tour also, uh, you know, the world is far from ideal, however you look at it. Uh, and we're in a neighborhood in San Francisco where there are some people who might want to come into Noise Bridge who really don't belong. And uh, we have a subjective um, uh, a way of looking at who belongs and who doesn't belong at Noise Bridge. And whoever gives the tour uses their best judgment on, uh, on who belongs and who doesn't. But people who belong in Noise Bridge are people who both benefit from and contribute to our community. And whatever that means, it can be financial, it can be by giving a class, taking a class, learning, smiling, um, giving tour, whatever, um, that's contributing. And benefiting from is all these different ways. We have a warm, friendly community, which is really good and important for everyone in, um, everyone who's human on the planet and even other species. Um, <clears throat> and um, um, we also have classes and workshops and tools. So we have to both benefit from and contribute to. If someone comes into NoiseBridge and only wants to use it to be um, out of the, it can be kind of cold in when it's raining and zero degrees Celsius outside. Um, and unfortunately, there are a lot of people in San Francisco who need shelter. Also, unfortunately, NoiseBridge isn't a place for that. Uh, if, if a homeless person who needs shelter as well wants to come to NoiseBridge and use NoiseBridge as a hacker space and benefit from and contribute to the community, they're totally welcome as long as they follow our one rule, just like absolutely everybody else. Doesn't matter about homeless or not. Doesn't matter if you're gay or not, or boy or girl, or transsexual, or uh, uh, skin color, all this stuff. It doesn't matter as long as you follow our one rule. But people coming to use NoiseBridge but not contribute are not welcome. So people have to use their judgment for that, or if they come because they want to use our bathrooms to use drugs, which has happened in the past. We don't want people to do that. Um, so anyways, these are some of, you know, part of the realities of um, the world we live in and the neighborhood in San Francisco we're in. So um, yeah, people use their judgment. And again, that's how we pass along um, who belongs, who doesn't, what Noisebridge is about how people are welcome into the community to feel good uh, and being there, to be there as much or as little as they like, to make use of all the resources there, to be part of the, part of the community as much or as little as they like. Um, so, and, and again, that works really well for us. Yeah, so uh, we have lots of amazing tools, some ex inexpensive, uh, some super expensive. And with the exception of our laser cutter, you don't need to take a class to use any of them. The laser cutter we got last year as a donation, it's a really big, expensive machine which can be broken um, without too much problem. And we want to make sure that uh, people who use it will be safe and also that the, the tool will remain working as a resource for everyone who comes along who, who wants to use it. So that one we have a training class, but that's, that happens every week. And it also happens if someone who's already um, trained on it uh, to teach how to use it is there and you can just say, hey, can you show me? And then if they have some time, then they, they usually show it. It, it only takes like uh, 15 minutes or so to learn how to use it. It's quite easy to use. And once you know how to use it, it's safe for you. It's safe for the tool. We do have other tools that are extremely dangerous, though, uh, you know, like a circular table saw. Table saws, you can cut off a finger or a foot or have a two by four go through your chest if you use it improperly. Um, in all the years we've been around, we've had a table saw or two and uh, no one's ever hurt themselves um, with permanent damage. And this is true of all of our tools. We look out for each other. If you don't know how to use a tool, you just ask. And if someone's using a tool and it looks like they're using it improperly, it is way not excellent to let them continue. And it's also not excellent to use a tool that you might hurt yourself or others or the tool. Um, 
and that's pretty much agreed upon by everybody at Noisebridge, very much agreed upon. So um, we're always looking out for each other. The, the way we look at it, the more cool people who are part of our community both contribute to and benefit from uh, our community, the more cool people in our community, the more we're looking at more cool people to look out for each other and uh, the more positive things happen and the less negative. And, uh, and the more people who are part of our discussion of keeping our culture alive, you know, what is and is not excellent. And that, that conversation really does go on a lot. And the use of tools is just one aspect of what is and isn't excellent, how to use tools um, and how to learn. So, but you don't have to be an expert in order to do things. That's part of duocracy. We're not a meritocracy, we're a duocracy. So if you wanna do something, do it. Some stuff might be dangerous, life is dangerous, but we definitely want people to be as safe as possible. Um, but uh, there's a hackerspace in Kansas City uh, in the United States, Kansas City, Missouri. They uh, have um, 10 rules. And um, one of their rules, we have one, but they have 10, starting with rule zero. Uh, and their rule zero is uh, be excellent to each other. But rule number one for them is safety third. So in, in English, people often say safety first, and safety is important, but it's not the most important thing. If we're always concerned with safety as the first thing, lots of cool things won't happen. But it, some people are more and less averse to risk, and we don't force people to do unsafe things by any means. Um, but we want people to try things to push their envelope and uh, learn from mistakes and we want definitely people to be able to recover from anything they do that doesn't work as planned so we do want people to be safe um, but we do have lots of tools anyone can use them if they break hopefully uh, you tell other people about it so that either you or with the help of other people or other people can fix it so uh, education um, one of the best ways to learn anything is by doing things. And there's a lot of words for that. Project-based learning in pedagogical theory is one way of saying it. Hands-on, play-based learning uh, is another way of saying it. But Noisebridge, pretty much everything is hands-on. Uh, hands-on, project-based, play-based learning. And schools are more and more exploring this as ways of learning, having more and more of that as part of their curricula, which I think is fantastic. The schools have been going more and more into taking tests. And one of the big primary motivators for me to start Noisebridge was because our schools, not only in the United States, but all over the world, suck. They're terrible. Um, they've been focusing more and more on taking tests. And taking tests, um, for any bureaucratic, um, entity, including ones for education, they need some form of evaluation, but it's gotten out of control. It's become more about the evaluation and not about what it's supposedly evaluating. Education is all about learning and really learning how to learn and not learning specific things. Um, so, um, but you know, as you learn, having a test to evaluate it seems like a good idea, but more and more school is about training on how to take these standardized tests so that the bureaucracies can know that the bureaucracies can continue. And uh, it's out of control at Noisebridge. We do have some classes that train people on how to take certain tests for certification that are credentials for like jobs and other activities. Um, but for the most part, and also for like amateur radio, ham radio, we have um, uh, sometimes training people on how to take the test so you can get a ham radio license uh, and things like that. But for the most part at Noisebridge, almost 100% is just project-based hands-on learning. Occasionally though, there's a class uh, or a series of classes for learning things where, which is sort of the more traditional academic approach where someone who knows a lot uh, is in front using our, um, our uh, projectors, as we call them here, beamers, as you say in Germany, and uh, speakers, and we can have live streaming with our gigabit internet connection that's donated from a local service provider here. And um, um, <clears throat> so we do have a, a bunch of classes, uh, but even those have usually hands-on aspects 
to them because um, it just works really well. But we, again, we don't have any rules about this. If people enjoy the structure of the class, then it will continue and maybe they'll do it again and more people will come. Uh, as long as people want it, it happens. The way classes and workshops happen at NoiseBridge is someone wants to do it. You don't need to be a member to teach a class. You don't have to be an expert to do it. It's considered ex excellent to be upfront about it. Like I, I once uh, created a workshop where um, uh, I wanted to have uh, a bunch of people come together, put our heads together to try to learn how to use an Android phone to play with Arduino. So an Arduino is a little board with a microcontroller on it, you know, like this, and um, it's a little computer chip, and it can be programmed from an Android phone. But back when we did this workshop, not many people had done that yet. And about 50 people showed up. And I know a lot about microcontrollers. I knew a bunch about Arduino. I knew very little about Android. Uh, but some other people came who knew about Android and not much about microcontrollers. Not many people knew a lot about everything. A bunch of people came not knowing much about anything. But by the end of the workshop, everyone who wanted to had rooted their Android phones. And uh, everyone who wanted to had their Android phone programming uh, computer chips uh, in the form of Android bo uh, 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 Arduino boards. And um, so, yeah, we were all up front about what we knew and what we did. And we learned a lot from each other. And it was a lot of fun. It was like f four hours almost. And um, so, yeah, someone who wants a class, they can say, you know, I really want to learn about this. And we can talk about it in the space. We have IRC, we've got email, we've got a user forum, we've got blog. People can put out the word any way they want. Um, and it, they can say, I'm interested in learning about um, uh, uh, advanced aspects of databases using Python. I just made that up. But if someone wants that they c and they don't know it, then maybe a bunch of people can come. Maybe they can find uh, an online course that they can do together. Or they can have it more formal. They can invite someone in who knows that. Or maybe they know it and they want to teach other people because they think it's awesome. Um, so they put out the word if other people like it. They can put it on our wiki. Our, our website is a wiki. Anyone in the world can change it. Um, and anyone can change it back, too, if it's not excellent. But um, they can just put it on our events. They can put it on our recurring events if they want it to be a weekly thing or a daily thing. And if there's a space, uh, an area of our physical space where they can do it, um, then, then it happens. And if people enjoy it, they think it's excellent, people keep showing up, it keeps happening. Um, there's also informal ways of doing events as well. Uh, um, people at the space can just suddenly go, you know, you mentioned earlier that you were into this. I've been trying to learn this, and I've been having all this trouble. How about, uh, we, do you have time we can like help each other learn this? And that happens all the time. Um, there are people in NoiseBridge who are using the space for all sorts of different things, like to use one particular tool once, and then they leave and they never come again, or they come and they make a living using the tools to do whatever they do, uh, or they come uh, to learn because it's an environment where they can get help if they ask, if they have questions. Um, in the daytime, there's people using NoiseBridge as a co-working space, and at night, but mostly in the day, because uh, it's free. And uh, some of those people donate uh, to NoiseBridge and financially, some don't. Uh, but whatever, it's all OK, uh, as long as people are benefiting and uh, contributing to our community in some ways. Um, so those people are there. Often they have extra time and energy, and people help each other. And it's part of what makes our, our community really feel good to be part of. So all of that. Uh, and, and more is how uh, uh, learning happens at NoiseBridge, both informal and formal. Yeah, well, so people can use NoiseBridge any way they want as long as they follow our one rule, right? Um, and they're both, you know, uh, everyone is both uh, contributing to and uh, benefiting from the community. And using NoiseBridge as a co-working space is totally fine. And we do have gigabit internet for free. It's kind of amazing. You can upload gigabytes of photos if you want to it in, in you know seconds. And um, uh, accessing huge databases and downloading them for whatever purpose. Um, so NoiseBridge 
Um, you know, so like there are a lot of entrepreneurial people who use NoiseBridge. And, um, you know, myself, one of the co-founders, uh, I started my own company um, to <laughs> put this invention, TV Be Gone, out in the world to help people turn TVs off, which I think is a great thing. And, um, you know, I've, me and 12 friends have made a living off of it for the last 13 years. Uh, that was before NoiseBridge. But other people uh, come up with ideas that they find opportunities uh, either at NoiseBridge or elsewhere. But NoiseBridge is a fantastic creative environment for people to explore and try things. And if they find things that they really like, hopefully they really love, if they find things that are meaningful to them personally, there's all these people in NoiseBridge that might be excited about it or not, <clears throat> and people who help and ha get into conversations about their project, whatever it is, whether it's a, a, an app for a phone or a blinky light or some world-changing thing, whatever it, it might be, people can get excited about it there. And then if enough people are excited at NoiseBridge, um, they might find an opportunity to make whatever they're doing available to other people, good services, whatever. Um, then they have an idea for a startup that's way worthwhile, something that people will pay them to do because other people will find meaning in what they're doing too. And, you know, people pay for that. <clears throat> Capitalism at its best is uh, people supporting each other, usually financially, for doing something they think is really cool. Um, there are other aspects of capitalism as well, but at its best, that, that is what I would like to support. And um, so that is supported at NoiseBridge and other hacker spaces around the world, usually. And so when people come up with cool ideas, yeah, it'd be great if people made a living from doing their cool ideas rather than going out and getting some, just some stupid job that wastes their time. Hopefully they have enough energy after their stupid job to actually do something worthwhile with whatever little time they have left. But even better than that would be to make a living doing what you really love doing, you know, so that it's not like taking time off a of life to go to work so that you can get enough money to do what you really like. That's an option, but why not make a living doing, getting enough of what you need by doing what you really love doing? I mean, that's ideal. And, you know, NoiseBridge can support that and other hackerspaces and other communities as well. So people who find ideas that they want to pursue, hopefully that they find meaning in doing that they really like and love, they can do that at NoiseBridge rather than just doing it at home alone. They can do it at NoiseBridge where there are other people around also doing that in their own way. And there are people to get support from. And there's also shared resources, tools like internet, electricity, warmth, community companionship, um, and whatever other tools uh, that they might need to work on their projects. So it works, it works really well, um, like so many other aspects of NoiseBridge. The first thing is definitely, it's about community. Okay, so it's about community. Whether you call it makerspace, hackerspace, or whatever, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> it's about community. It's not about the tools. It's about the community. So you, the starter, the person who wants to start a hackerspace, um, or you and a handful of other people, whatever it is, think about the culture that you want to spend a lot of time in. A lot of time because if it's successful you're gonna spend a lot of time there one because it takes a lot of work but it's way rewarding and you'll want to spend a lot of time there because it's so incredibly cool you know imagine the culture you want to spend a lot of time with if it's just you write it down but get other people you can um, uh, much more readily um, uh, articulate, uh, know what you want out of community if you can articulate it with other people. And then write it down and then put that word out there and that will attract more people that fit in with the culture that you envision. And that makes your vision stronger and then that can spread much more easily. And that attracts more people which makes it stronger, etc. <clears throat> As the community grows, you don't have a physical space probably from the beginning unless someone does have a, a space to start in, and that's totally fine too. Um, um, but you are you are got to spread the word, and not everyone is going to fit in with your vision, and that's good. You don't want everyone. That's 7 billion people. They won't fit. 
and you can't deal with seven billion people. There will be people you absolutely loathe. There'll definitely be a lot of people you don't like. Um, and that's okay. We don't have to like all seven billion people of the planet. Hopefully we're respectful of people whether we like them or not. But for our community, there are people who belong and who don't. Define that. Put the word out positively of who you want, what you want in your culture that will attract people who fit in. One of the people, if not more, will be good enough at graphics so that when you pick a name that you like, they can come up with a logo so that you can then have a simple web page by the domain uh, and you have a simple web page and you can make stickers that you can hand out because people like stickers They're fun You can put them on your laptops on skateboards on lamp poles, whatever just give them out And it has your web address and if you have a physical space your physical address and if you don't have it eventually you'll have a physical space and you put it on there and um, So it's really important to articulate what you want out of community and put the word out and um don't water down your vision because of working out of fear. This is one of the ways that hackerspaces have failed. So they're worried, oh, we're in a place where there's not a lot of money, and this person comes along who has money, but they don't quite fit into our vision. Or maybe they have a space, or maybe they have some cool tools, um, but they don't quite fit into our vision. So they water down their vision in order to attract the person with the resources they want rather than a person they want because of who they are and how they fit in with the community. <clears throat> and then the vision's watered down, people start losing interest, and it just kind of fizzles. And that's one of the few failure modes for hackerspaces. So don't, don't do that. That's just, uh, you know, take that into account. Um, one really great resource, which is how the hackerspace movement started, was by people doing a talk about how to start a hackerspace, and they created what they called Hackerspace design patterns. You can do a search for that, or you can look on hackerspaces.org, which is another great resource for lots of reasons. And um, uh, hackerspace design patterns is what has worked well and not so well for lots of hackerspaces around the world. And we can learn from each other. It doesn't mean you have to do it the way others have, or you have to avoid what other people's mistakes are, but if you do something that didn't work for someone else, do so consciously. So it's a fantastic resource. Um, yeah, and then the tools are important, but that's not the focus. So the community has uh, a vision for what they want, how to structure yourself, how to organize yourself, the kind of activities you want to focus on, maybe things you don't want to focus on. That's okay, too. It's better to focus on the positive, though, what kind of rules you want, you know, like in Noisebridge, we have one. Other hackerspaces, they really want lots of rules so everyone knows what's expected of them. Whatever works for you and your community is totally fine. Um, uh, but there are other hackerspaces around the world who are always ready to help. And hackerspaces.org is a way for people in hackerspaces to network with each other, whether it's people who are long-term veterans like me or people who are just interested in learning uh, or people who want to start a space, people who have started a space and they're having problems. Whatever, people, hackerspaces around the world all help each other. So, but the community, get back to tools, uh, the community um, uh, has things they want to focus on. They'll need some tools for that. That's when you focus on the tools, what tools you want. But again, it's not about the tools. It's about the community and what the community wants and what they're going to benefit from. And um, uh, yeah, and then there are a lot of models to draw from on how to proceed now. So I have uh, Ted X Brussels talk. You can just search for that. You know, Mitch Altman TEDx Brussels or Mitch Altman TED talk will even get it. And um, uh, I wrote an article for Make Magazine a long time ago uh, called um, How to Create a Hackerspace. That's available for free online. And there are a lot of other people who've written about hackerspaces and their experiences. At the bottom of the Noisebridge website, noisebridge.net, is um, a link to our 501c3 process. And that's good for people primarily in the US, but pretty much everywhere in the, in the world to see what we had to go through in order to formally become an official nonprofit corporation uh, in you know where we are. Um, but a lot of that overlaps for people anywhere in the US and people anywhere in the world. 
And there are other hackerspaces who have made all of that public as well. And that could be helpful for you starting your space if you want to start a space. And I, I encourage people to start spaces. These hackerspaces are fantastic opportunities for lots of people who wouldn't have them otherwise. And they provide community for people. Um, and we need community, and there's not enough of it in our lives. And if we start our own communities, those are ones that are really good for us and the people who are in our community. And, and if they're good for us, they're good for the people around us as well. And enough of people do this, it's really better and better for our local areas and, and the world eventually. So there are thousands of hackerspaces in the world now, but we really, really do need millions in order for more people to have these kind of opportunities. And um, it, it, San Francisco has, uh, the San Francisco area has something like 35 hackerspaces now and related organizations, but we need, we need probably thousands. So it, we, and, and it's not competing, they're complementary. There are a few in the city of San Francisco. We don't compete with each other. We help each other. Because the more we help each other, the more we all gain. Because there's uh, 800,000 people in the city of San Francisco. And Noisebridge has hundreds of people going through every week. But that's nothing compared to 800,000. And even if you combine all the hackerspaces in all of uh, San Francisco, that's still just too teeny. We need lots more. All of them unique for the people who organize and make it happen. So I encourage more people to start hackerspaces. It helps you and your friends and the community, you have people who are attracted to you and the people uh, around you and San Francisco in general, if it's in San Francisco or wherever you are, wherever you are. And um, yeah, so uh, it's a lot of work, but it's incredibly rewarding. And it, it makes, um, it's a very healing process as well. Um, when we're focused on helping other people we're also helping ourselves. It's a very healing process for us. And uh, it helps so many people in so many different ways. And um, yeah, try it. And if you ever need any help, I'm certainly way happy to answer any questions and help any way I can. How can I answer this more concisely? So, you know, the big picture is we live on a world where I believe I would love to be proven wrong, but I believe that a vast majority of people on our planet don't feel that their lives are way worthwhile. You know, we, we, it's really sad, you know, like there's just so many people, how, whatever the percentage is, there are so many people on our planet who don't feel that their lives are way worthwhile. Most people, I think, are just trying to get by. You know, they're trying to get enough resources, usually money, in order to get food and shelter. This is absurd. You know, like we have enough resources on our planet. We don't have to be having a majority of people or whatever percentage of people on the planet just scrambling just to get barely enough resources to get food and shelter just so they can keep alive. Um, you know, what would the world be like if even some smaller percentage more of people felt their lives were f amazingly awesome? You know, just, uh, that they were just glad to be alive and sharing what they do with other people. We really need that. You know, way back when, um, I don't know what humanity was like. Um, people lived in small tribes, clans. People supported each other. Maybe the environment was very hostile. People got together. They learned from each other. They created tools of various sorts. And, um, they made their lives maybe a bit more secure, maybe more enjoyable, whatever. We've been using tools since the beginning of our species. Other species use tools too. This is part of having a big brain. Um, we also support each other um, and we can do so much more sharing our resources, including our intelligence, our experience, our tools, um, teaching methods. We can do so much more when we do all of that, sharing all of that than if we do it on our own. On our own, we can do a lot, but we can do so much more in a supportive community. Hackerspaces provide the community. They provide some tools that the community wants, and they provide way, uh, ways of learning and sharing these tools and learning and sharing anything the community wants. This is incredibly beneficial for people to find meaning 
in what they do with their time. And the more you spend your time, use your time, um, doing things that you find meaningful, the more worthwhile you find your life. And that is contagious and it spreads to other people. We really do live in a world where people aren't doing that as much as they would like. And no matter how much you're doing that, you can do that more. No matter how cool your life is, it can be cooler. And no matter how horrible your life is, it can still be at least a little bit cooler um, if we can share our resources more and sharing our resources we have plenty of resources to share and money is just one resources out of an infinite number along the way from the beginning of humanity um, at some point we started planting food into the ground because sometimes it was scarce uh, once we started doing that we needed um, protection from other people who are coming around stealing the food that we spent so much time growing and maybe that's how the first wars started and some bigger conflicts started happening that weren't possible before and because people are capable of making all sorts of tools we made some pretty nasty tools and there that that process is still happening today um, if we get together in community that's supportive uh, doing things that we find worthwhile, feeling our lives are way worthwhile, my hope is that people will focus their time and energy doing things that are way worthwhile rather than focusing on how to hurt and harm other people they find to be or believe to be nasty. Um, we live in a world now, after going through lots of ordeals and you know, a couple of world wars in the last century, um, where maybe, maybe, we don't really have to do that anymore, if we ever did have to. Um, but we are in a place right now where we don't have a lot of community, where we don't feel connected to much that is we, that's bigger than ourselves. Um, you know, we've been through a lot of really huge religions. Some of them are still around. Uh, for a lot of people on our planet, growing numbers, it seems, those religions don't really provide a sense of being part of something bigger than oneself anymore. And we need other ways to do that. Uh, corporations have made things easier for people in some ways, way more difficult in others, depending on where you live in the world, but also, you know, at the expense of our environment, uh, air and water and uh, other resources. Um, it's been harmful in that way and other ways and um, it's also been harmful in a way that people quite often don't look at even the same things that are helpful they can make goods and services that can make life easier but in making life easier we've become more disconnected from the food that we eat that sustains us from the things we use in our daily lives, which, which most of us have no clue how they work, what the consequences of using them are, both in our daily lives and in society and in our environment. Um, we're disconnected from all of that and we're living lives and it's looked positively, especially as American males, to be as independent as possible. And there's advantages to that, but one of the disadvantages is we don't feel we're part of a community. We're not part of something bigger than ourselves. We're not part of making the world a place we want to be. It's the world is there when we were born, the world will be there after we're dead, um, and we're just getting by in the interim. What if we were an active participant in all of that? And when you ask you know, about becoming a more of a maker, I think that's really what it's about. It's becoming more involved in the process of living your own life. And we can do that much, much, much easier and more readily and more positively sharing resources with other in a supportive community. And you know, this is why I focus on uh, hacker spaces because that's one form of a community that's supportive, which gives people the opportunity to explore, to learn, with other people to see the benefits of that and share that with others and more and more people find that their lives, they find more meaning in their life, they find their lives are way more worthwhile as a result. 
And again, it's contagious and more people start more hacker spaces and people can become more part of the process of creating things rather than just buying things merely because they're cheap. It's actually can be quite um, fulfilling to make your own thing, even if it's not as good, even if it takes longer, even if it costs more. The, uh, the, the purpose of life is up to each and every one of us to determine. We don't have a definition for that. Uh, but by living a life you find meaningful, you can find purpose in your life. But one thing I can definitely say, the purpose of life is not to live things as inexpensively as possible. The purpose of life is not to make as much money as possible. Uh, the purpose of life is not uh, um, to uh, die rich. It's not to, uh, the purpose of life is not to die. <laughs> the purpose of life is to live in whatever way you find purpose in living. A circular definition, but that's the only way we can do it. And you can only do that if you are personally involved in your life. <laughs> and that's much uh, easier in a supportive community. Thank you.